school where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And so that's uh, from uh, his, his letter uh, to the Romans. Once again, it's great to see you today. God bless you for being here. I want to begin a, a sermon uh, series today entitled, Where I Belong. And uh, we're going to take as, that, those are the, the long-awaited steps. <laughs> Listen, uh, until these were put in just the other, other day, if you fell in that hole, you weren't getting out. <laughs> Okay, because there was a there was a door to the church that act, didn't actually have a lock on it. Because Lord help you if you fell down in there, you you ain't getting in anywhere. But it did have a stick in it that would keep you from getting in the church. But um, uh, I want to I want to uh, read today from First Samuel chapter seventeen verses thirty eight through forty. If we talk about the thing where I belong, these are familiar verses for us. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. <coughs> then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. In the 70s, there was a song by Billy Joe Thomas from Texas, better known as B.J. Thomas, entitled Home Where I Belong. By the way, B.J. Thomas just died last week. We are all seeking belonging. We're all seeking acceptance. And we want to be accepted for who we are. Not that any of us believe that we're 100% right the way we are. That's not the point. But we want to be accepted for who we are. And most folks have had the uncomfortable um, situation of being somewhere where you just felt kind of out of place. You just couldn't feel like yourself. And you notice, if you ever have that feeling that you're out of place, everything you say is wrong. Because you don't know what to say. And so you say things, you're trying to fill up the dead air, and everything you say is not right. Because you don't feel comfortable. On the other hand, if you feel comfortable, uh, then you can hardly make a mistake. The mistakes that your friends make, by the way, you overlook. And the mistakes that your enemies make, you exaggerate. Okay. And we used a verse the other week that talked about perfect love casting out fear. There's no fear in love, the scripture says, because perfect love casts out fear. When you're around people with whom you feel comfortable, you don't worry about them getting mad at you. Right? Because you're not afraid. Why? Because you're perfect love. But when you're around somebody or some people that you don't feel comfortable with, you've got fear. That's scriptural. But we want to be accepted for who we are because we are all individual creations of God and we have individual gifts. Let me bring to your mind three things from the text that we read which had to do with David uh, and his, his last little interaction with Saul before he went to fight Goliath and before the confrontation actually began. And I want to apply these things to you and me, even as they apply to David in, in his time. Number one, I want you to consider that you have a call. You have a calling from God. Now, the number of people that are going to be called to what we would consider a full-time ministry type of position is a small number, okay? Doesn't matter whether it's whether it's uh, pastoring, being uh, some kind of evangelistic ministry, working for uh, Feed the Children, being a missionary, the number of people that are going to be called into that is a relatively small number. Now, the church, by the way, is a volunteer organization. 
Now, I'm aware that churches will have paid people. The larger the church, the more people there will be, and the more money that goes into that. Um, but the church itself is a volunteer organization because paid people can't accomplish what the church accomplishes as a group. It can't be done. It's a volunteer organization. As a volunteer organization, it is held together by an unenforceable bond. Now, at your work, you have an enforceable bond. Well, there's one there. And so if, uh, if you're an employee and you're not making it to work on time, uh, whoever is your supervisor will say, say, listen, uh, I know you've been, been late. Have you been having any kind of problem? Well, no, I'm just running behind. Well, you need to start getting here on time. And if you don't heed enough of those warnings, you get in trouble. Why? Because the bond's enforceable. The bond in the church is not enforceable. That's why when people get adjured to do something, they get mad. Because the bond's not enforceable. You understand? And so, um, not that we ought to go around adjuring people to do things, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, but you don't, may not have a calling for full-time ministry, but you've got a calling of some kind. To say that you don't is just almost the same as saying you don't have it, there's nothing that God wants you to do. And that's not true. Everybody has some kind of something they can do. Now, I do understand that there are some people that kind of struggle with what they ought to do because, you know, sometimes we get too narrow a focus and we think, well, I can't, I can't sing. I can't, I can't play the uh, instrument at all. You know, look, look, we got all kinds of instruments. If you want to bring a tin can, we'll let you bang on that, you know. I mean, you see something of stuff. You know, we, we got all kinds of noises going on up here. But you understand what I'm saying? It's kind of hard for people if they don't see themselves as a singer or some kind of speaker or don't feel like they should go to Africa or something like that. Think, you know, what, what can I do? Well, let none hear you idly saying, there is nothing I can do. I say it, I say it very often. You don't have to go to the third world to find poverty. I mean, good grief, there's, there's folks living on North Street or a couple of streets over that there could be some kind of ministry taken to those people. There's, there's something you can do, and uh, you have a calling of God. You may not feel that it is uh, uh, very, for lack of a better word, honorable or something that's going to attract much attention, but there's something that you can do. David was called to fight Goliath. Now there are other callings on David's life as well, but David was called to fight Goliath. Now, since he believed he was called to fight Goliath, he was not afraid to do that. And when he was going to fight the Philistine, he went against convention and advice. Now, and the midweek message, which you wait with rapt attention to, uh, I'm sure because it's, you know, the highest, you know, three and a half minutes of your day. I understand that. Uh, but we've been going through the book of Proverbs, and in the Proverbs, uh, Solomon says again and again and again that it's important that you receive wise counsel, that, that multitude of counselors are safety and things like that. But you get a lot of advice in your life, and I do, and not all of it's good advice. And sometimes you have to go against advice. I do uh, anger management and related type of classes. One of the things that I mentioned is that uh, anger's not necessarily a bad thing. We live in a terrible world if nobody ever got mad about anything. I mean, every now and then, somebody has to say, that's enough. This, this is where we're going to take a stand right here. You, you just can't go along with everything. Now, now Goliath had been out there defying the Israelite army. And he'd been doing it in the morning and later in the day. And, and they were terrified. Everybody was afraid of him. And nobody wanted to fight him. And David came to the battlefront and he started thinking, I can fight him. Not only, I, not only can I, I will, and he volunteered. 
Your calling may be out of the norm. May be different than everyone else's. Paul had a different type of calling. We read the verse in Romans 15. Let me read the verses in the context. Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Paul said, it's always been my ambition to build where nobody built before. Apply it to your life any way you can. It's kind of hard to walk in on somebody else's project and pick up where they were left off because you don't know exactly what they were thinking about. But Paul said, I want to have an original work. And through me, God has allowed the Gentiles to be brought to him. Those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. And so Paul said, I'm going to places that other people are not going. In my heart, I enjoy ministering where other people do not minister. 80% of all church growth is transfer growth. But there has to be something going on in the church world besides taking people from one church to go to another church to tap in there. And I'm not even saying it's wrong for somebody to go from one place to another. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is there has to be some ministry to people who have not heard so that they will hear. And to people who have not believed so that they will understand. And to have that, you have to go in places where there's no ministry going on. And that's the hard way every time. But Paul said, that has always been my desire that I could do that so that people who have not heard will hear. And you have a calling from God. What, what is that calling? It may be something that is original to you. Secondly, your calling may not meet the expectations or approval of others. Saul did not believe that David could fight and win against Goliath. He said to him, you're just a young man. He's been fighting people since he was a young man. He's, he's nine feet, over nine feet tall. By the way, the ceiling in here is, is nine feet and ten inches. He was almost that tall. And Saul said, there's no way that you can fight this man. And everyone was afraid of Goliath. If there hadn't been, they'd already had a month just for somebody to go out there and at least give it a shot. But nobody did. And everybody's afraid of the life. You may be afraid of your calling. I'm going to say that maybe everybody doesn't know it, but there's some of you right now that are doing something in your life that you'd really rather not do but you're doing it because it needs to be done. And because you feel like that God is using you. I spoke with someone on the phone this week and they're asking me about something, what my opinion was on their situation. And I said, well, my opinion is that you ought not to do what you're asking me if you should do. 
But if I was in your place, I'd probably do the same thing. <laughs> you remember something that you would tell everybody not to do, but when the weight's on you, it feels different. It's like the old thing they always say about you, you know, you know better how to raise kids until you have them. You know, and then you're, who are these? You know, where'd you come from anyway? You know, I mean, really. My wife said, don't do that, you'll embarrass your kids. They're like they never embarrassed me. <laughs> you may be afraid to do what you really believe God wants you to do. Often on the rock I tremble, faint of heart and weak of knee, but the steadfast rock of ages never trembles on me. God is always pulling victory out of the jaws of defeat, or what looks like defeat. From all the human standpoints, it looks like it's the end. And then God gets involved. And you may be afraid of your calling. Let me share something with you about our church here. I could not tell you how many people when I let folks begin to know we were going to begin said don't do it. I couldn't tell you how many. And here's what they said. There are people that you want to think that you can count on and they're not going to stay with you. They were right. And that started happening almost from the very start. But God led other people. Look, look, look. I could not describe to you adequately, personally, the pain that that caused me. But it started from the very beginning. And see, it was against some advice. <laughs> but I believed it was from God. And so even though it looked like it was against advice, I didn't, I didn't choose no way. Remember we talked about a few weeks ago how in the book of Hebrews it said they were not mindful of where they came because if they weren't they could have gone back. Now all of you look back on your life and I do too and we think you know if I could have done that over 15 years ago 20 years ago, 25 years ago I wouldn't have done that. I understand you saying that but you know if, if you took that out of your life it might change a lot of other things in your life that you do enjoy. Do not close the door on the path, nor regret past, nor regret it. Doesn't mean you don't recognize that some bad mistakes were made. But I'll, I'll tell you something. God's grace covers that. God's grace covers that. But you have to be you have to be convinced of what God has led you to do. And what you're led to do may be against advice. And approval. And everybody's afraid of Goliath, and you might be afraid of the task in front of you. Doesn't mean it's not God's will. <laughs> and David had confidence based on past experience. He said, when Saul said, this man has been fighting people since he was young. Why do you think you can fight him? David said, I already killed a lion and a bear. And he said, of the lion and the bear, he said, he said, I grabbed him by the beard and killed him. I want to tell you something. Grabbing a wild animal by the beard, the chin, that's the business end of that animal.
And David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Mm -hmm. I'm not fighting, God's fighting. Mm -hmm. He was convinced. And David had no resume up to this point other than what he knew had happened while he was guarding the sheep and his brother said to just a few of them and most people in that day did not have big herds of sheep anyway. And watching sheep was considered a child's job. Shared with you the other week how a friend of mine on Facebook that now lives in, in um, Massachusetts. I said, here's the sidewalk that we didn't want to build, but it looks nice, doesn't it? Something like that. He said, that sidewalk is for people that will walk to your church and friends that you haven't met yet. The other day, Memorial Day, our daughter-in-law came over with grandkids to visit us during the day. Our older son, Brian, has already been in Georgia. He's moved down there, and uh, we've helped him over the last couple of weeks as we could. And we drove over to the church before she uh, went back to Lebanon, and she's going to walk through. And Deb said, I'll sit in the car if you can take her. I said, no, I'll tell you what, why don't you take her through there, and I'll, I'll sit in the car with kids. So she took her through there. You, I don't know if you, you remember, I told you a few weeks ago there was a fellow in, in church here that I said lived in right across the street from the church. When they were coming out of the church, he came across the parking lot to meet them. And he said, I haven't been able to come to church lately, but here's my tithe. Wow. You don't know where deliverance is coming from. You just know it's from the Lord. See, here's the thing. God works through people. And we talk about this a lot. God works through people. You know, if you have a financial need, God's probably not going to drop a bag of money on you. Probably not. But he'll figure out some way to, to, to meet your need. And I couldn't tell you how many people I've known over time, even including myself, where you, you say, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. What's my next move here? And it's almost like everything that you read that's positive is a discouragement to you because, you know, what, who am I? You know, and, but God will meet you. And, and David said, the, the Lord that delivered me from the lion and from the bear will deliver me out of his hands. And by the way, just foreshadowing, Goliath said to David, he said, am I a dog that you come out of me with stick and stones? Come to me and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said, I'll give your flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field and I'm going to cut your head off that all these people will know that God does not deliver according to human means and he's really in control and you don't know it but you're fighting against God I just happen to be the one here now and so Saul agreed he said well I'll, okay okay go ahead but he wanted David to use a different fighting method because David was just in his shepherd's clothes and whatever that entailed and had his, his sling and his, and, his, uh, and his bag there, the shepherd's bag. And, and so Saul said, well, let me at least give you some nice clothes. And so David put him on and he felt like Ray Hollister on the Andy Griffith show. And then government clothes. <laughs> but he put on Saul's tunic. And then he put his armor on over top of that and he put his sword on and he tried to walk around in it but he wasn't confident. Number one, he wasn't his size to begin with. The Bible says, seems to indicate Saul was a very tall person. Okay. And it just didn't fit him. Have you ever worn clothes 
that you and your host can get out the door, put them on, and then you get to work and he told something something went right like this. You know, maybe the scene is wrong or something. You didn't notice it. How did that how did it go for you that day? David tried to walk around and he thought, I can't, I just can't. Here, here's the point. Saul was well intentioned. He was trying to help him, right? And he he, he, he thought, well, I'll I'll give him my armor because nobody's got armor as good as me, and I'll help him. Now, here's the thing. There will be people in your life that discourage you that think they're helping. They really think they're helping. And you'll be thinking, how can they think that this is a good thing? And yet, that's just the way it is. Have you ever said to anybody, quit helping me? I have. Thank you, but stop. <laughs> By the way, David said, I've fought some battles and won before, and I think I can win again. That is the reason that I have confidence in the method talking to people about salvation who you do not know. Most of the time I go to someone's door or talk to someone somewhere about the Lord, most of the time they're not saved, they don't get saved. A, a good deal of the time they're not interested at all. But I have seen people get saved before. And I know it can happen. You need, you need to remember that whatever task you're applying your hand that God has encouraged you to do, you need to remember that it can happen. E.V. Hill said it doesn't happen every time, but you're always in a position for it to happen. So Saul was well-intentioned, and David tried. He tried. Have you ever been in the uncomfortable position of trying to do something somebody else wanted you to do, and you just couldn't make it work, and they said, do it this way, and just didn't work for you? I have. I passed a lot of different places, and uh, I, I've gone a lot of, well, not a lot of places, but in different areas of the country and everything. And uh, two things everybody says, no matter where you go. Number one, they say people here are different. I do not believe that. I've never noticed that anywhere I've been. People are basically the same. They have these little different individual things about them, but they're, they're, they're basically the same. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody needs acceptance. Everybody wants to take care of the family, you know, there's the basic things to apply to everybody. Same thing they say is, is the weather. If you don't like it, it'll change in just a couple minutes. Everywhere I've ever lived, that's all they say. I know that those two things are coming. Uh, but David gave a good effort to try to use it. He, he didn't just say, Saul, keep the armor. Saul said, okay, here, and David, David put it on. And passion in different places, everywhere you go, the church has got a different, different vibe to it. They always do. And some of that is good and some of that's not good. But you have to try to fit in to the best you can. But I'll tell you something, it's been true of me, it'll be true of you. You can't wear somebody else's armor. Mm -hmm. You can't. You may try, but you can't. I use the I use the example many times. It's like a little bumper sticker. Some of you may have it. I don't know. Have you seen maybe the bumper sticker says if it ain't country, it ain't music? <laughs> now I, I know I know why that bumper sticker is given. It's, it's given to be cute and funny and everything. And it is cute and funny. But I want to say this. If you can only appreciate one kind of music, then your taste is not that great. <laughs> There's different types of music. See? If you can only appreciate one type of preaching, then you don't have a very wide range to you, okay? Because there's more than one type of preaching. 
And you have to learn to appreciate different types of ministry. But what happens a lot of times is we get so ingrained in what we've been doing that we don't even think we can, we can do anything any different. It just happens. And, and by the way, look, there's a degree in which we're all that way. Because we've all got a, a, a personal bias, you know, toward things. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean it's bad, you know, just to have a bias. It's not wrong to have a bias. I've got a bias toward my kids. It don't mean I hate yours, you know. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? You know, we've all got certain things that we like better. But we've got to realize something. God's a big God. And, uh, and there's a lot of ways to minister. And sometimes you're given that opportunity and sometimes not. I have tried to do things that I did not find comfortable to make other people comfortable. By the way, that's not wrong. I mean, it's it, there's, it's fine to, to try to accommodate. I mean, you know, if I'm going to go out to eat somewhere at church, I think. <laughs> and uh, Somebody's going to say to me, say, where do you want to go? And I'm going to say what I say every time. And they don't care where you want to go. It's fine. Why? Because I don't mind. I don't know where you want to go. It's fine. It's good with me. So it's good to be accommodating if you can. But, but you can't be somebody you're not. You can't. I heard someone say one time, it might have been James Dobson, but don't hold me to that, but it's somebody in that vein. And he said this, he said that the, the most cruel thing you can do somebody is, to somebody is criticize something that they can't change. See, if you don't like my hair, I can cut it a different way. I mean, hey. <laughs> the less of it there is, the greater challenge that is for <laughs> I can wear different clothes, but there's some things about me that are endemic to being me. And the same thing's true of you. And Saul tried to use the armor, but he couldn't. And against advice, he went out to fight a man that no one thought he could defeat except he himself. Thirdly, your calling is a contract with God. Your calling is not up to me. Your calling is up to God. We must be what God has created us to be. Now the Bible in many ways is prescriptive. Okay, and as it tells us what should we should do. For instance, all of us are supposed to pray. You, you know, there, there's some things that are good for everybody, the Bible prescriptive. By the way, uh, uh, many people who would doubt God's word and, and want to argue about uh, will make a mistake on this point. But remember this, because something is stated in the Bible that it happened does not mean God is approving that it happened. It's just a statement of what it happened. People will use that as um, when you're debating uh, difficult issues like why God allowed polygamy in the Old Testament. You, you see what I'm saying? Just because the Bible states that it happened does not mean that God will that it happened. And there's a lot of different things that fit that type of type of scenario. But the Bible is prescriptive in many ways of how we should live as believers and what we should do. And it may be prescriptive in specific things, but the Bible is also principled. In other words, it may not tell us exactly what to do in every situation, but it tells us what the general modus of operating is supposed to be. In other words, what I do is supposed to be done in love. Now, it's not a lot of times. Why? Because I'm doing it, I'm a sinful person, but it's supposed to be done in love. So I know that. I have to apply that principle in my life. But, but you can't be somebody that you're not. And so your ministry must be a couple of things. Number one, it must be comfortable. And that, that does not mean it's effortless. Okay? It might be, might be very hard. 
there will be a lot of things in the Christian life that are very hard for you. And so hopefully those things won't be continual. But the ministry that you're performing ought not chafe. It ought to be something that you can do and have a degree of comfort in. Why? Because you're a unique creation by God. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, the teaching of a rabbi in that day was called their yoke. And Jesus said, take your yoke on me. But most of the time when we think about a yoke, we, we think about the yoking up of animals. And I, think, I don't think that's a stretch to say that. But Jesus said, I've got a teaching for you, and it, it may be a burden. I've got a job for you. You don't put animals in the yoke to have to stand there. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, you know, my, but my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, and, and you may be doing some things I'm aware of right now that you think are God's will, and they may be very difficult. But listen, that is not as difficult as it would be to live life without God and to have restlessness because of the lifestyle that you're living. Secondly, the uh, calling that you have that is a contract with God must be effective. David knew what would work. See, see, when he put on Saul's armor, he said, this won't work. This won't work. And so he went back to the method that he knew would work. I am just going to imagine that nobody else thought that would work against Goliath except him. But he knew it would work. It was a simple method. He took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistines. How many of those stones did it take? One. You know, he took one. But he really didn't know how many it would take, so he took five. You know, he, he figured he, he wasn't going to have much more time than to get all five shots. That was probably as far much as he was going to get to do, but only took one shot. Because his method was effective. And thirdly, since you're an individual creation and under God, uh, your ministry must be individual. I believe in going along, and, and by the way, I'm a traditionalist. Now, of course, that depends on, that's sort of an eye to the whole of things, just to be honest, you know. But God made us all individuals. Paul said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, this is the start of his ministry again, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. It may be very valid for you to take advice. It may be very valid for you to seek counsel. But you need to find out what God wants you to do. And nobody else can find that out for you. You have to find that out. But God doesn't call you to do nothing. He doesn't call you to inactivity. He called you for something. And by the way, where, where you're at in your life right now, your calling may, may have shifted a little bit. It, at my young age, I'm finding out that I can't do some of the things that I did a few years ago. But there's other things that I can do. Okay? The other day we were unloading from the picnic, you know, the Memorial Day picnic, but it was so cold. Remember how it was cold? And, and uh, Billy and I were over here, we were unloading something, and, and he said, you want to go get this? I said, I said, no, Bronson will be here in a minute. Wait till you get here, we'll make him do it. Greg, <laughs> he's 100 years younger than we are, so. <laughs> you know, there's some things that, that I can't do just the same way that I did in the past, but there's other things that I can do. And so I have to continually stay before God and try to find out what he wants me to do. What is it that God wants you to do? Let's pray. Many Bible passages emphasize the fact that believers are joined together.
the great prison in collaboration. The church as a unit can accomplish more than as individuals can working alone because it's, it's easier for a group to accomplish something than just an individual. And so those are great truths. But God has a design for your individual life. It is an individual design of divine making and you live your life under God. Not under your church or under me or under your spouse. And I'm not saying any of those things are bad, of course. But God has an individual desire and design for your life. Many, many people, if they had taken advice of other people, would not have done what they did for God's honor. David wouldn't have. But he was convinced that God had a ministry for his life. Father, we ask you today in every life, including my own, to speak your truth. Reveal how you can best use us and what your will is, not our own will, not the will of other people, but what your will is. And as we latch hold of your will, help us to be confident therein because we're listening to you. And today we may be stumbling in the dark, uncertain of the next step to take. We ask your advice, comfort, and direction those individual sins that we must confess daily. Father, may we confess those even now. Pray that you would heal the hurts. The decisions that need to be made give your divine wisdom. May we be the vessels that you use to lead others to yourself and increase the kingdom of God on this earth. And all these things we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand with me. We're going to repeat the prayer of lifting up of hands, the ironic blessing. If you would join me, please. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Tonight we have a